<laughs> so then, the, so as, as mentioned by, by Bernadette at the beginning, we have a range of species in, in this project, um, some of which are inbreeding crops and some of which are outbreeding. So we now have uh, an introduction to work on inbreeding species presented by David Loy from Aberystwyth. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep, I assume so. Yeah, okay. Well, as Catherine said, I'm, I'm David Lloyd. I'm Head of Forage Breeding at Germinal Horizon, uh, based at Aberystwyth University at Ibers um, in the UK. And I'm going to be talking about essentially what, what breeding is from a traditional point of view, what we're trying to achieve in plant breeding, focusing really on agricultural species and specifically on legumes, but these principles can be extended to other species, obviously. What inbreeding species are, and I'll be talking about outbreeding species tomorrow. Uh, what pure line cultivars are, which uh, is the, the sort of typical way that um, we breed uh, inbreeding species. I'm going to give a couple of examples of how we traditionally breed pure line cultivars and a couple of examples of how we can speed things up. Uh, it's important to, to note that this is just going to be a brief introduction. Full coverage of uh, these concepts would easily fill a semester worth of undergraduate level. Uh, lectures. So apologies if I skip over some of the more nuanced aspects of the subject. And at this point, I'm also going to um, say that uh, I, I see that in conversion to the to PDF format, uh, my slides seem to have changed slightly. So um, yeah, we'll see how it, that goes. So what is plant breeding? It's essentially the development of cultivars that are better suited for our needs. Um, we can view, view it as selection to produce genetically superior cultivars. And one way of to think of it is as directed evolution. What we're trying to achieve is, well, obviously the main objective is usually higher yields, higher yield potential, and also more reliable, more sustainable yields, yield stability. So this can inc uh, include pest and disease tolerance, and resistance, abiotic stress tolerance. One of the biggest advances is, uh, advances in plant breeding was the introduction of dwarf wheat varieties, which made them less susceptible to lodging under wind, um, uh, the influence of wind. Uh, better adaptation to environments. Nutrient use efficiency is a big topic at the moment. Phosphorus, for example, is a finite resource which we're running out of, um, and legumes are particularly phosphorus hungry. New varieties that are able to thrive under lower inputs would be a major advance. We're breeding for differences in maturity and dormancy. For example, soybean um, is not grown to any great extent in the UK. Even triple zero um, maturity groups um, fail to mature um, in time uh, to be harvested in the UK. So, um, sort of it, sort of getting faster maturing varieties would be a, um, a major step forward with this. We also breed for quality, which um, covers a huge range, range of traits, and I'll, I'll go into that in, in some detail later. Okay. So what is a cultivar? Um, a cultivar is essentially a cultivated variety of plant. And we use that, uh, the terms cultivar and variety, variety often interchangeably. Um, it, that may or may not be correct, but um, that's the way it, it is, I'm afraid. So it's a variety of plant that has been developed for a specific use, has some degree of protection under plant breeders' rights, similar to patenting, uh, satisfies requirements of distinctiveness, uniformity and stability. So distinctiveness, it must be distinct from other already available cultivars. Uh, uniformity, uh, individual genotypes of the cultivar should conform to a prescribed degree of uniformity. So all the plants within that variety should be essentially very similar or the same and stability, it must stay true to its description when reproduced. Um, so measurements of, of distinctiveness and, um, and uniformity are, are provided by um, the International Union of for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants, UPOV. This is an international group um, with 77 members worldwide, roughly half of the countries in the world, most including most of the uh, developed nations. And cultivars are somewhat defined by their reproductive biology. So you get pure line cultivars, which I'm going to talk about, um, open pollinated cultivars, which I'll talk about tomorrow, and various other types, uh, including hybrid cultivars, clonal cultivars, which I'm not going to cover. 
So pure line inbreeding cultivars, these tend to be species that naturally self-pollinate, um, including many cereals, wheat and barley, for example, most grain legumes. Um, they tend to pollinate before the flower opens, so the, there's no availability of the uh, to, for interpollination with other plants. We call them pure line cultivars because they're mostly developed as highly homozygous um, so populations. So homozygous, uh, levels of homozygosity of 95% or more. We generally start them off with hand crossing and then take them through various forms of single seed descent with selection. And on the right there, there's some pictures of, um, that's a pea flower being um, hand crossed. Um, the first picture there is the petals of the female plant being removed, um, stamens being removed and, and anthers being removed um, before, sorry, stamens being removed before the anthers um, mature, and pollen being applied from a more advanced male parent flower. The classic way of breeding pure line cultivars is the pedigree method. So F1s are uh, produced in a, in a hand cross. They're self to produce segregating F2s that are planted as space plants. Uh, the best plants or the, the plants which most um, fit the, our requirements are selected and seed from these are sown as progeny rows. Uh, the individual seeds from selected rows are sown as new progeny rows from individual plants within the, uh, within the selected rows. And when you get to a suitable level of homozygosity, Seed is harvested as a, a bulk from the row and sown in yield trials. Um, so this um, selection from progeny rows is, is, is repeated over several seasons, increasing number sites. Sorry, yield trials are repeated at, um, at several sites over a number of seasons um, and increasing plot sizes. Eventually you get to a point where one or more line is selected for, for progression as a variety. And it's then entered into statutory trials where they're measured independently for DUS and value for cultivation and use. So the DUS characteristics are the UPOV characteristics already mentioned. And if um, they satisfy the statutory requirements, uh, you have a new variety. Bulk method. This is a, an alternative method of breeding. Um, so it starts at, uh, as before, crosses are made to produce an F1 generation. The F1 is, um, sorry, the progeny then is, is advanced for several generations as a bulk. So all seed from all plants is, is, is collected and sown essentially as, as a plot. No, no selections taking place for the first few generations. Once the population gets to a suitable level of homozygosity, usually F6 generation or higher, then selection started. And the remainder of the methods progresses as per the pedigree methods um, in the previous slide. Um, generally, there's only one generation of row selection. So both methods have pros and cons. The pedigree method is intuitive, easy to understand. Lots of people use it. Um, sometimes this is because it's the way it's always been done. It's a relatively quick method, um, a lot of effort. It's very labor intensive. intensive. Um, it's fair to say a lot of um, selection takes place at a very early stage of, of uh, development of, of the varieties. Um, so quite often you end up select, um, getting rid of plants where um, traits have not segregated properly. It's a poor selection method for quantitative traits for that reason. Bulk method is very simple. No selections made until a high degree of homozygosity has been achieved. But the problem with it really is that breeding cycles can be very long. There's a, a long period bef uh, of, um, of development before any selections takes place. There's, it's possible to use combinations of the two approaches um, and you know, various um, sort of refinements of this can, can be used. Um, but uh, those are the, the two main approaches used for producing pure line cultivars. There's a number of ways we can um, speed things up. So 
We can use speed breeding. This is um, growing um, plants under controlled lighting, often with very long day lengths, um, to optimize um, the, the rate, the, the sort of length of time between sowing a seed and actually harvesting seed from the, the, the plant that res results. It's very good for getting to F2 stage in one year. It can be used with the, the bulk method um, to, to speed up the, the generation time. Um, but you end up with um, glass houses running at, uh, at full capacity um, for 12 months a year often, which is perfect um, conditions for pathogens and pests um, to, uh, to promulgate. Um, some downtime in, in glass house use is, is very helpful for controlling pests and pathogens. It's important to, to be aware that, um, as well uh, with this, that some level of mass selection takes place within this approach. Um, you, you tend to be selecting for plants that will grow very well under long day lengths in, in glass houses, which may be counterintuitive uh, to, to what we're trying to achieve. We can use off-site multiplication, so growing um, in uh, the summer in northern hemisphere, then sending uh, progeny down to the, the winter, down to the southern hemisphere for uh, multiplication or more selection. Works very well with the bulk method. Uh, it can be confounded by uh, concerns of uh, phytosanitary certification. Border controls can often be indifferent to deadlines that we, we um, are, are bound by within breeding. Again, care is needed to ensure that no selections are happening in non-target environments. So if we're, um, say, uh, multiplying plants in Chile for use in the UK, we have to be careful that we're not um, selecting for use in Chile. Um, we use marker-assisted selection. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, any length about this. Uh, it can save a lot of time on phenotyping, particularly when you're looking at traits that take time to be expressed. And um, we can screen at seedling stages, so we can start off with a lot more plants um, and get rid of the plants which don't have um, the alleles of interest. Uh, works very well in combination with speed breeding. It needs a considerable investment in characterizing markers, either through QTL analysis or, or GWAS. Um, and it works very well on simple Mendelian traits and not so well on polygenic traits where you've got a lot of uh, QTLs with um, small effects. Genomic selection, so re refinement to marker assisted selection, and you're going to be hearing an awful lot about this uh, over the next two days. Um, so I'm not going to go into any great depth. Basically, it models effects of, of all um, markers um, across the genome on, on traits of interest. Uh, you might notice that I haven't listed doubled haploids. This is where haploid cells, usually pollen, is cultured and ploidy doubled to achieve homozygosity um, at a very early stage. It's not really a, a reality in legume species at the moment. Um, there's been a lot of advances made in cereals, for example, but uh, it's just not a, a technique that is available to us. So that's really um, a, a brief introduction to what what we do with uh, inbreeding species. Um, that was very quick. I would be very happy to take some questions if there are any. We have no questions at the moment. Does anybody have any? Are there any questions anybody would like to ask at this stage? Thank you. Otherwise, thank you, David, for a, an excellent introduction um, to the inbreeding species and uh, their relevance to UCLEG. Um, we now have a scheduled um, break in the proceedings to allow people to get a cup of coffee. Unfortunately, if this was a live performance, we would now be all congregating and having a cup of coffee um, together and you'd be able to speak to the, to the speakers informally. But that, of course, is not possible at the moment. Um, we look forward to that being a possibility soon. Um, but so we will now adjourn until uh, uh, half past nine. Um,
sorry, half past ten. Sorry, I'm in the UK. Get my time right. Um, and we will resume at that point then. Okay, thank you very much.